All right, welcome to my webinar on some of 2019's best and most highly anticipated young adult novels. I'm Jessica Robinson, and I'm the cataloging librarian for the North Dakota State Library. Uh, but Reader's Advisory is one of my greatest passions, both in work and outside of it. So this is my third year of doing this particular webinar, so I am so excited to talk to you all about some of the great books uh, that came out earlier this year, as well as covering some of the hottest new releases of April and May, and to um, gush a little bit about the books that are coming out uh, in the future. Forget how to use PowerPoint for a second. Good start, you guys. Third year doing it. <laughs> uh, so like I said, I'm going to start today with some of 2019's earliest releases. Um, we're going to span about January to March. My goal is always to talk about books that are both clear hits and to also discuss some awesome titles that may not be getting as much attention. Um, feel free to let me know if you have a favorite that you don't hear about today. My original list when I started was a monster, so I know I'm missing out on dozens and dozens of other great titles. Also, please don't worry about writing down every author, or title right away. Um, there's slides at the end with all of this information, and this video will be made available online at a later point. Okay, so let's go. So I'm cheating a little with this first title since I feel like everybody in the YA world has been talking about it since it came out in January. Uh, Karen M. McManus exploded onto the young adult scene in 2017 with One of Us is Lying. With Two Can Keep a Secret, she proved that it was not a fluke. There's been um, some confusion about this being a sequel, but it is actually a standalone book. Um, but the exciting news, very exciting news, is that McManus is writing the sequel to One of Us Says Lying called One of Us Is Next, which is slated to be released um, sometime next year. I think it was mid next year. I can't remember the exact date. Um, Meanwhile, Two Can Keep a Secret will help satisfy that itch with what a bookseller friend of mine described as a mystery within a mystery within a mystery. Good description. She's a very smart girl. Um, Ellery knows that Echo Ridge is not the idyllic small town that it appears to be. Her aunt went missing there uh, on the night she was crowned homecoming queen, and the town got national attention when years later another homecoming queen was found murdered. But Ellery still doesn't know quite how twisted Echo Ridge really is, or what secrets her mother and grandmother are hiding from her and her twin brother. Remember, two can keep a secret if one of them is dead. Now, our next book is also a murder mystery, which I think you'll see is a big trend this year in particular for both teen and adult books. Spindled by Lamar Giles, starts with the murder of Paris Accord, a teenage girl poised on the cusp of national musical fame under the name DJ Parsec, which as an aside, um, that's an amazing DJ name. I absolutely love it. Paris had a growing fan base led by her number one super fan, Fuse, and a former best friend named Kaya, who still misses the girl who abandoned her for fame. Fuse and Kaya find themselves at odds after her death and begin a competitive race to figure out who murdered DJ Parsec, while not so secretly suspecting the other of doing the deed. Spin is, um, it's just all about the dark side of fame, where the passion that uplifts the celebrity is also what can pull them down. Now, let's uh, switch gears from murder to large-scale robbery with Kayla Brorig's Death Prefers Blondes. Um, Beyond having a great name, Death Prefers Blondes has an awesome premise. Margot Manning is a famous teen socialite that spends her days being pursued by the paparazzi. Margot's nights are a different story, however. She then shunts her designer dresses for ski masks and dodges every camera in the city in order to be one of the most famous cat burglars of all time, aided by an entourage of kickboxing drag queens. Margot loves her double life, but when her two worlds begin to collide, she has to use all of her skills from both in order to protect her friends and family, and maybe to make the biggest score of her young career. 
this should like definitely be made into a movie basically tomorrow because I would watch it. All right. Now our next book is perfect for teens and adults who like a little bit of the macabre in their teen dramas. Sean David Hutchinson, The Past and Other Things That Should Stay Buried, is about the disintegration of a friendship and getting an unexpected second chance to make things right. Dino is comfortable with the dead, which is good since death is the family business, and he lives in a funeral home that usually contains one or two spare corpses. However, it's very different when you know one of the corpses, which Dino discovers when his best friend Judy ends up in one of the coffins. This upsetting situation is made even more complicated when Judy gets back up one night. Dino and Judy must try to figure out why Judy has risen from her grave while simultaneously facing the problems that destroyed their friendship. It's hard to say which of these is a harder problem for them, but anybody that wants to read a supernatural take on a kind of a familiar issue should definitely check this book out. All right. Um, well, now this next book has been getting a lot of good buzz. The Music of What Happens by Bill Konigsberg is about my favorite of all romance tropes, Opposites Attract, set in the scorching heat of Mesa, Arizona. Max is cool, collected, and casually out to everybody in his life, including his equally chill mom. Max's only problem is a secret that he won't share with anybody and can barely even bring himself to think about. Meanwhile, Jordan is full of secrets. He's deeply closeted, incredibly insecure, and convinced that it's completely up to him to keep his mother from spiraling out of control and destroying what's left of their family. One hot Arizona summer brings the two of these boys together on a food truck, and against all odds, they decide that it's worth trying to make it work, even if on the surface they seem to have nothing in common. Okay, now I'm obsessed with the cover of this next book. I think it's gorgeous. Just the colors, the design, everything. Um, the name is Rain and Delilah's Midnight Matinee by Jeff Zettner. And he may have written this book specifically for me because it combines so many of my favorite things together. Late night creature feature shows, quirky horror hosts, and cute MMA fighters. Delia and Josie are Rain Ravenscroft, amazing, and Delilah Darkwood the hostesses with the mostesses of The Midnight Madman, a local horror movie show. Delia and Josie love their TV show, but it's their senior year and they're two teenage girls about to reach adulthood. Josie can't decide between her dreams of attending a big university and her desire to stay close to her family friends and the fantasy novel reading MMA fighter, what a great combination, who makes guest appearances on The Matinee. Meanwhile, Delia can't bear the thought of their show ending not when it means that she might lose Josie forever, just like she lost her father when he abandoned her years ago. Rain in uh, Delilah's Midnight Matinee feels like this total throwback to the 80s, which is you know, such a huge thing right now, and I love it. <clears throat> um, okay, so next, Julie Berry's Lovely War. Um, well, it also has a lovely cover. If you suspect that cover design played a big role in the books that I selected to talk about, you'd be correct. But um, it's really easy to do because I think YA fiction has some of the best cover designs in the entire business. They, it's amazing what they can create. Anyway, Lovely War has a unique premise for a teen novel, which I hope will make it stand out this year. Basically, it's about two connected love stories set during World War I as told by the Greek goddess Aphrodite to her husband and her lover, Ares, in a plush Manhattan hotel in the middle of World War II. Sounds complicated, yes, fantastically so. The love stories involve four deeply creative people, including an African-American musician whose career is sidetracked by the Great War, and a Belgian torch singer whose life is upended by the German army. Again, as told by the goddess of love, as she attempts to figure out why love and war seem so connected in her life and in the lives of others. If you have any fans of historical fiction and or in Greek mythology, two things I was obsessed with from about 12 to 34, <laughs> this is an unusual melding of the two. 
Now our last author on this slide is a debut author, which I love to highlight, especially when the debut is as accomplished as opposite of always, by Justin A. Reynolds. Not to be confused with Jason Reynolds, because I have run into that mistake myself a lot. Um, opposite of always is a love story. It's also a tragedy. And just to make it even more appealing, it's a time travel story. Let me explain. Jack is the guy who always comes in second place in school and in life. However, he believes that his curse of almost has lifted when he meets Kate. Funny, beautiful, and instantly tight with his best friends. And then Kate dies. But instead of this being another time when things almost went right for Jack, he finds himself back at the beginning of their relationship. Saving Kate is all that Jack wants to do, but he quickly finds out that pulling on one string might unravel the entire quilt of his life and the lives of people around him, leading Jack on an adventure that is always almost giving him the life he wants. Now we turn to the last of the early releases, starting with Emily Henry's When the Sky Fell on Splendor. Splendor, Ohio was the site of a horrific accident when the local steel mill exploded leaving the town devastated and main character Franny's brother in a coma. Franny needs a distraction from the horrors of her everyday life and finds it in an unusual group called The Ordinary, young people who investigate local legends and ghost stories in splendor and post their findings online. Sounds fun. At first, The Ordinary is exactly what Franny needed until the day that the team go to investigate a mysterious object that fell from the sky, an object that will change Splendor again forever. In another book about a horrific reality, Samira Ahmed explores a terrifying possible future in her book, Internment. Set in the near future, Internment is about Layla Ahmed, a teenage girl who lives in an internment camp for Muslim Americans. Layla had a full life before her internment, complete with a loving boyfriend who remains one of her few links to what's happening in the country as the camp's director works to keep the residents ignorant of what's happening in the outside world. After making some new friends inside the camp, Leila decides to start a revolution in order to retake her rights as a U.S. citizen and as a human being. Her plan may put her family in danger, but Leila knows that fighting back is even more important than just staying alive. And this is one fight that she absolutely refuses to lose. Oh, exciting. Okay. Now we move on to one of my absolute favorite YA authors. A.S. King knocks him out of the park every time she's about. From my favorite book of hers, please ignore Vera Deeds, everyone go out and read this book, it's amazing, to the spectacular Still Life with Tornado. With Dig, A.S. King returns to the fertile ground of misfits and family drama that she excels at, as we follow the lives of the Hennings family, specifically, we follow the grandchildren of the wealthy descendants of potato farmers turned real estate moguls. The Hemmings' grandchildren have grown up knowing that they won't see any of their family's wealth, and this book explores their attempts to ground themselves in any reality when they have no idea what their future will look like. Again, I love A.S. King. The way she writes teenage characters and their struggles to find out their identities is unparalleled, and Dig is a tremendous addition to her work. Finally, we close out our early releases with another thriller, I told you, they're real popular this year, and talk about Adriana Mather's Killing November, the first in a new series. Killing November takes place in an exclusive and elusive boarding school for the children of assassins, spies, and world-class thieves. November Adley is a new addition to the school where competition is everything and everyone is assumed to be a competitor. When one of November's classmates winds up dead, November becomes the number one suspect, forcing her to join the unspoken competition in a race to discover the real killer before she becomes the next victim. I'm a like, huge sucker for these kinds of stories, um, and this one looks amazing. All right, now let's transition from early releases to what's happening right now and talk about some April and May titles. Starting with Ashley Poston's The Princess and the Fangirl, we have a fun fairy tale reimagining in kind of in the tradition of Rainbow Rowell. Um, this is technically a sequel to Poston's 2017 Geekerella, 
Um, it's in the Once Upon a Con series, since it deals with the same fictional TV franchise, Starfield, but it's easy to read it by itself. As the name suggests, Princess and the Fangirl is a retelling of The Prince and the Pauper with a fandom twist. Imogen Lovelace is a capital S superfan of Jessica Stone, an actress who not only plays her favorite character in her favorite TV show, but also looks almost exactly like her. What a huge coincidence. <laughs> a disastrous first meeting at a fan convention makes them enemies, but an even more disastrous script leak forces them to work together to save the franchise Imogen loves while trying to help Jessica leave the intense scrutiny of her fandom behind. My suggestion would be to pick this book up and Geekerella, because it's great too, and then wait for her next entry in the series, which is going to be a Beauty and the Beast retelling. Now, let us return to the well of historical fiction with White Rose by Kip Wilson. This beautiful book, again, lovely as covers, all, all of them. It's told in verse, and it presents a fictional account of the life of Sophie Scholl, a German college student who helped found the White Rose, which is a real resistance group during World War II that specialized in nonviolent resistance. Kip Wilson follows Sophie's story as she distributes letters criticizing the Nazi regime and their violence against the Jewish population before she and her brother are arrested for treason. This is a completely fascinating story of the resistance movement in Nazi Germany, made even more incredible by the courage and determination of the young woman that came to stand as the face of the White Rose. Um, our next book, it's, um, oh God, it is an absolutely heart-wrenching and surreal account of grief told by the best-selling author of 2016's Girl in Pieces. Kathleen Glasgow's How to Make Friends with the Darts Dark starts with the death of Tiger's mother and then shows her emotional spiral into depression and anger. It's so difficult to um, capture those raw emotions of grief and make it interesting um, and connect, but Glasgow does it almost effortlessly, um, making a story that's kind of light on plot, but very, very heavy in feeling. Now, to lighten things up a little bit, um, I talked about Always Never Yours, the super charming debut novel of Emily Wiberly and Austin Sigmund Broca last year. And this year they're at it again with I'm Being Honest. I love this book. This time they feature a queen bee named Cameron Bright, a popular high school senior with a reputation for brutal honesty. When her mouth drives away her crush Andrew, Cameron decides to take a page out of the Taming of the Shrew and, well, tame herself. This leads her to Brendan, a guy whose school life she complicated years ago with an impromptu nickname. Initially, Brendan wants no part of this self-improvement project. But the more Cameron tries to fix herself for Andrew, the more Brendan feels that she was better off the way she was before, even with her rough edges. And the more Cameron wonders why she's trying to change into someone she doesn't even like for a boy who doesn't want anything to do with the real her. Okay. Um, okay, so I know that I've said a lot of these covers are the best cover, but I think we can all agree that this next one is tremendous. Jennifer Dugan's Hot Dog Girl lives up to the promise of its cover with a story of dreamy pirates, loyal carousel operators, and uncomfortable mascot uniforms in the middle of summer. At first, Lou Parker was thrilled to be working at the Magic Castle playground for the summer, even if her job was to be a dancing hot dog. However, her plan to win over the handsome, diving pirate Nick is foiled by his romance with the princess of the park, and her best friend, Celie, is showing an unexpected disinterest in going along with her particular scheme to win him over. Plus, it looks like this might be the last one summer anyone gets to have at the Magic Castle Playland, unless Lou can find a way to keep the park open and to have her perfect summer romance. We end this slide with the, um, oh my gosh, exceptional With the Fire on High by Elizabeth Acevedo, the author of last year's mega award-winning book, The Poet X. Honestly, I think this book is even better than The Poet X, and it's got a great premise. 
It uh, features Emini Santiago, a high school senior who has more responsibility on her shoulders than most of her peers between caring for her young daughter and her grandmother who raised her after her mother's death and childbirth. Emini's only release is in the kitchen where she excels at creating food that's frankly hard to read about because it all sounds delicious. There's a little bit of romance, a lot of family bonding, and again, some of the best descriptions of food that you are ever gonna read. I'm honestly getting hungry just sitting here thinking about it. So let's just move. This book is great. All right, and we have two authors, which should sound familiar to lovers of teen science fiction. Jay Kristoff and Armie Kaufman wrote the best-selling trilogy, um, The Illuminae Files, about an alien invasion, starting with Illuminae back in um, uh, 2015. Now they're back with the start of a new series, Aurora Rising in the Aurora Cycle, which is currently planned out to be yeah, probably another trilogy. <laughs> they usually are. Uh, this first book has a definite uh, Guardians of the Galaxy feel to it, with one of the taglines being, they're not the heroes we deserve, they're just the ones we could find. Um, our main character is a gifted pupil at the Auroric Academy in the 24th century, but his over-enthusiastic heroism wins him a squad made up of all the people the Academy can't foist on anybody else including a sociopathic scientist and a diplomat with a huge sarcasm problem. The squad has to try to pull together when they rescue a girl from the cryosleep nap she's been in for the past 200 years and immediately ends up being a catalyst for an intergalactic war. But no pressure, right? No, they'll be fine. Okay, so in addition to having, say it with me, a gorgeous cover, this next book, Nafisa Azad's recent release, The Candle and the Flame, has been getting some great buzz. Uh, this is a debut novel from an author who describes herself as someone who reads too many books, watches too many K-dramas, and writes stories about girls taking over the role, which sounds amazing. In The Candle and the Flame, we follow Fatima in the city of Noor, run by the Jinn, and containing a myriad of different religions and cultures. When Fatima gains the ability to control fire after the death of a powerful Ifrit, She's changed in more ways than she or her family could ever have anticipated. Finally, we end this section on a very recent release. Arvin Ahmadi's Girl Gone Viral came out on Tuesday and is about coding in mysteries, which is obviously the best combination. Uh, Opal Hopper is a gifted coder, still bereft from her father's disappearance on her 10th birthday. She's tried to move on. But when the world's largest virtual reality platform, WAVE, all in caps, I hope that came across, announces a contest where the prize is meeting its reclusive billionaire founder, please know the same reclusive billionaire founder that Opal's father worked with before he disappeared, she knows what she has to do. Opal isn't leaving this game to chance, but when the dad hack she performed to give herself the edge reveals a few more secrets than she anticipated, she realized that her personal mystery might have bigger consequences than she could have ever imagined. All right, now let's keep rolling right on to our last section today, which by the way, is my favorite section. These are some of the great titles we can look forward to as 2019 keeps rolling along. All right, first here's one that's coming out super, super soon. Margaret Rogerson's Sorcery of Thorns is out on June 4th, so now's a good time to look it up. Our heroine is Elizabeth, raised as an orphan in a magical library, awesome, and taught to see all sorcerers as dangerous and evil. Elizabeth wants to become a warden so she can protect her home from the magical threats that surround them. But when one of the library's most dangerous grimoires is released into the world, and Elizabeth is implicated in the crime, she has no choice but to team up with Nathaniel Thorne, a powerful sorcerer with a demonic butler. Basically, um, Elizabeth had the dream job. She was a librarian with a battle axe. And this book is all about her trying to get it back while a sexy sorcerer tries to convince her to change career paths. Amazing. Our next book takes place in contemporary Seoul, which is pretty unusual for YA fiction. So I'm, uh, I'm pretty excited about it. Like Nafisa is that um, I also watch way too many K dramas. So, very fun. This is The Wicked Fox by Cat Show, and it's about a kumiho, 
a nine-tailed fox who has to consume the energy of men in order to live. The main character is Gumiyang, and the enormous city of Seoul is the perfect place for her to feed on corrupt men and hide from anybody who might still believe in the old myths of her kind. When Miyoung breaks her rules for safety and rescues a, we can assume, very cute boy from a goblin, she loses her fox bead, which houses her soul. Now Miyoung must work to find her bead while resisting her attraction to this human boy who's heard stories of her people from his grandmother his entire life. My feeling is that she's um, not going to be super successful at both of her roles, but since this is the first book in a new series, we're going to have a lot of opportunity to find out. Now we're going to move forward a bit and talk about a great title for August in Stacey Lee's The Downstairs Girl. This is a good pick for readers who enjoy historical fiction, especially historical fiction that shines a light on people and events that don't normally get mentioned in uh, history books. The Downstairs Girl is about Joe Kwan, a lady's maid in the employ of the wealthiest man in 1890s Atlanta. In her day job, Joe is kept busy by the cruel whims of her boss's spoiled daughter. In her night job, Joe is one of the most successful advice columnists in the city, writing under the pen name Miss Sweetie. Joe wants to use her secret power to change ideas about gender and race in Georgia but her writing sets off a chain of events that leads her on a hunt for her birth parents, while also trying to avoid the detractors who want to expose her to the public. All right, let's switch gears and move on into September. All three of these books come out mid to late September, so that's something to look forward to when the weather once again starts to turn on us, even though it really hasn't turned nice yet, so whatever. Our first book is Suggested Reading by Dave Konis, and it's all about passionate readers, so of course I'm excited about it. Clara Evans is your typical bookworm. She stays up late to read and highlights her favorite passages in her favorite books. But when her school begins taking some of her favorite books out of circulation, as part of an effort to shield students away from questionable material in books like The Perks of Being a Wallflower, Speak in the Chocolate War, three amazing books, Clara becomes an underground librarian. With the help of the student body president, Clara runs the Unlib from her locker. But when a student's suicide attempt is linked to her rebel copy of The Catcher in the Rye, what started out as a fun bit of rebellion becomes an all-out war. Okay, so this next one, um, it sounds like a combination of The Babysitter's Club, uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and Sabrina the Teenage Witch. So it's basically encompassing my entire childhood, which is awesome. Uh, the name is The Babysitter's Coven by Kate Williams, and it's about Esme, veteran babysitter and secret travel magnet, and Cassandra who's way too cool to join a babysitter's club, but does when her mother leaves her a mysterious note telling her to find the babysitters. When both the girls discover that they belong to a secret society of magic and supernatural danger, they band together to wage war on the evil threatening their town, while still trying their best to potty train rambunctious two-year-olds. Honestly, I'd rather do the fighting evil part, but, you know, that's, that's me. <laughs> Lastly, for September, we have a spooky little story of ghosts and the bonds of sisterhood by Kate Alice Marshall. The title is Rules for Vanishing, and it starts when Sarah's sister Becca disappears, deep in the woods that are supposedly haunted by the ghost of Lucy Gallows. Great ghost name. One year later, Sarah is still walking around in a fog, completely estranged from her former friends and desperate to know if her sister is still alive. She gets a chance to find out when she and her friends begin receiving text messages telling them to play the game and find Lucy Gallows. Sarah knows that the woods are dangerous and she's not sure if it's right to ask her friends to help her after all this time. But she also knows that she'll do anything to find Becca, even if it means challenging a local legend on her own turf. Ooh, last slide. <laughs> There's some good ones on here. Okay. Let's uh, go into my favorite month of the year and look at three October releases that will make fall even more exciting than it always is. Renee Adia's The Wrath and the Dawn duology was this smash-up, and she's back at it again with the beautiful, 
This time Medea takes us to 19th century New Orleans and what supernatural creature seems to be the happiest in the Big Easy? If you guessed vampires, you're probably an Anne Rice fan and you're also 100% correct. I'm, um, I'm really excited to see Adia take on vampires like this. The Beautiful is part romance, part thriller, and it follows Celine Rousseau, a teen dressmaker from Paris seeking refuge in New Orleans and finding it in a mysterious underground society led by Sebastian Saint Germain. Germain? However, when the bodies of young girls begin piling up outside the doors of Sebastian's secret club, Celine starts to question her new benefactor, even as she's drawn deeper into his world. Um, what I like about this is it's so clearly taking its cues from those big vampire hits of the 80s and 90s, like the Vampire Lestat and the um, Chelsea Yarbrough Quinn books. And it's probably going to really appeal to readers who went through vampire romances to have a little bit more of that gothic flair to them. Next, we have War Girls by Tochi Anyabuchi which is the first in a new series set in a Black Panther-inspired Nigeria. War Girls takes place in 2172, after climate change and nuclear war have rendered most of the planet inhospitable to humans, prompting the wealthiest to flee to space colonies while the rest battle for resources. Two sisters spend their days fighting alongside soldiers with bionic limbs, mech suits, and artificial organs designed to protect them from radiation but what they want more than anything is peace. Um, I'm really interested to see what the reception is like when this book comes out, because I think it has uh, the potential to be pretty big. But unfortunately, I have a long, long way ahead of me. Even longer is our last book today. Coming out on October 22nd, so far from now, is Farah Naz Rishi's I Hope You Get This Message. It's about the end of the world, so that's a good start. The Earth has been contacted by a faraway planet called Alma, and its message is definitely not one of peace. Alma is giving Earth one week, and then they're going to destroy human civilization. But instead of this book being about trying to prevent that or having a big space adventure, I hope you get this message is about exploring what you would do if you knew the end was coming. For depressed truant Jesse Hewitt, this is just the punchline on the long joke that's been his life. For Kate Collins, this might be her last chance to find her adventurous father. And for Adim Khan, this should be his opportunity to forgive his sister for abandoning the family. But he's finding that idea even harder to accept than the incoming destruction of the planet. When the three of these teens end up crossing paths, they might just get their chance to make their final impact before everything has gone. Oh, okay. Um, so ending with the destruction of the planet is pretty final. Uh, but I'm excited about all of the books that I talked about today. If anybody has any questions, I am super ready and willing. Or if you feel more comfortable contacting me directly, that's great too. Otherwise, I am so happy that you listened to my webinar today, and I wish you all great reading in 2019. So here at the end are all the books that we discussed, along with the dates listed. So you can browse them at your leisure, because this is all going to go online. And then here, of course, is my information in case you want to contact me. And I don't think I see any questions, which is, like I said, totally fine. If you guys think of something you want to ask me later, go on ahead. Thank you, too. And um, yeah, thank you guys for coming. It's always fun. I love doing this.